Okay, so I'm really happy that our, our little study group has uh, reconvened again this week. Uh, last week, for those listening online, uh, we went through the inaugural uh, Universal History Lecture that was transcribed by one or several of Schiller's students uh, from 17, I think, 89 or so, which was a, a new field of study that was created by Schiller, who's often just known as being a dramatist, as a poet, um, living at the end of the 19th century, but they don't often, or sorry, late, late 18th century. He died in 1805 at a very young age. Um, but he's not often known for his work on history, which is uh, tragic, I find, because all of his dramas that he did all took place um, he, he selected these, these potent moments in history, which are just rich with tragedy, with, with heroism, um, that really determined the, the transformation of an entire society, whether it was his uh, Joan of Arc plays, whether it was his uh, Mary Stuart, uh, featuring a, a very pivotal moment in, uh, in uh, British history, or whether it was his Wilhelm Tell featuring the, the freedom struggle, of Republican movements that had arisen in uh, against tyranny in Switzerland, or his work on uh, Don Carlos, uh, featuring a real a real story of a real person, Don Carlos, who had a lot of potential to lead um, a Republican movement in in um, Flanders against the Spanish Habsburg monarchy. He always did these these um, these plays after immersing himself in a real study of that history, and he had a method by. Um, situating the context of every particular uh, moment in history within a broader universal continuity with a very strong philosophy, uh, going back thousands of years into the past with a, with a firm uh, view towards the future, because he himself, we can never not forget, just like Beethoven, um, had his heart and mind and creativity driven by the faith and belief that human beings were, were more than what we saw with our, with our eyes in the world that he lived in. And he lived in a time of the American Revolution. He saw that with his eyes. There was a great hope that that experience would be replicated in Europe and that the age of hereditary institutions would finally be overthrown and a new age of representative government, of this idea of, of all human beings made in the image of God and having uh, ec economic and political laws reflecting that truth, that was going to be this age of brotherhood, which was, we, we saw that very, very clearly in Beethoven's uh, um, treatment of Schiller's poem on the Ode to Joy or the Ode to Freedom, as Schiller called that in the Ninth Symphony. So it's important to just get the mind into, into that place of where these great creative geniuses were situating their identities and the purpose of what they were intervening upon in order to properly appreciate Schiller's universal history. So again, last week was the what is and to what end do we study universal history. Um, this week, today, we're going to read uh, the mission, not the mission, we're going to read the legislations of Lycurgus's uh, Sparta contrasted with the um, Solon, uh, the constitution of Solon's Athens as a comparative study of two constitutions, two uh, hypotheses of the nature of man, the nature of God, the nature of creation, uh, that express themselves in two very different types of statecraft um, that Schiller did in, as I think it was his second. And then next week we'll read the mission of Moses. So um, for those listening, they might be confused by what we do. So the version we're going to be reading that you're going to see visually on the screen is an abridged version. I think it's, it contains about 80, 85% of the text, but a small bit of the text will be missing. David, um, who people can't see, but you'll hear him. He has the actual hard copy book. So every time we, we run into um, a hiccup and we find that there's some text missing, Dave will chime in and read the missing part of the text and then we'll pick it up on the screen again. So um, let me just do a share screen. Okay, now can people see a Word document that says yeah. legislation, yeah? Yeah. Okay, good. So I'm taking this particular text from the, the Schiller Institute website. As I mentioned uh, before we started uh, the actual reading session here, there is this book um, which was published also by the Schiller Institute, which features a lot of the translations. I'm going to send out a link so people can purchase the book if they want to. Um, I think it's about 10 or 20 bucks. Um, really good, good investment. But so this is the abridged version of the, uh, the text. So here we go. And there's a rendition artistically of Solon, the lawgiver, and Lycurgus, I think, to his uh, right. 
So who would like to kick off the reading today? Uh, I can. Okay, I'll make it a little bit bigger too. I think. All right. That's great. That's better? Yeah, sure, that's perfect. Okay. Okay. So, to properly appreciate the Lycurgan plan, we must look back to the political situation in Sparta of that time and come to know the condition in which he found Lacedaemon Lac Sparta when he came forth with his new design. Two kings, both furnished with the same authority, stood at the head of the state, each jealous of the other, each busy to secure himself a following thus to set limits to the authority of his counterpart on the throne. This jealousy has been passed from the first two kings, Procles and Eurystheus, and their mutual lineages down to Lycurgus, so that Sparta was incessantly troubled by factions over this long span of time. By bestowing greater freedoms, each king attempted to corrupt the people to incline to him, and, this, and these concessions led the people to become insolent and, ultimately, to insurrection. <laughs> the state wavered to and fro between monarchy and democracy and swung in rapid su succession from one extreme to the other. No line was drawn between the rights of the people and the authority of the kings and the wealth flowed into the hands of a few families. The rich citizens tyrannized the poor, and the, and the desperation of the latter expressed itself in revolt. Torn asunder by internal discord, the weak state had inevitably fallen prey to hostile neighbors, or fallen completely apart into a number of small, uh, smaller tyrannies. And that is the condition in which Lycurgus found Sparta. No clear distinction between the authority of the, king, of the kings and the people. Unequal distribution of earthly goods among the citizens, lack of public spirit and concord, and complete political destitution were the maladies confronting the, the legislator, of which, therefore, he had to take account in his legislation. As the day arrived when I cur as the day arrived when Lycurgus wanted to announce his laws, he had 30 of the most prominent citizens whom he had previously won over to his plan appear armed in the marketplace, thus to instill fear in anyone who might resist. King Charolos, terrified by these measures, fled into the temple of Minerva because he believed it all directed against him. But he was dissuaded for, of this fear and in the end became so persuaded that he actively supported Lycurgus's plan himself. The first decree concerned the government to prevent the Republic from ever again being tossed to and fro between royal tyranny and anarchic democracy. Lycurgus established a third power as a counterweight between the two. He founded a Senate. The senators, 28 in number, or 30 together with the two kings, were to side with the people should the king abuse their authority. And if, on the other hand, the power of the people became too great, the Senate would protect the kings against the people. An excellent arrangement whereby Sparta was forever spared the violent domestic turmoil. Uh, Oops, sorry. Yeah. An excellent arrangement whereby Sparta was forever spared the violent domestic turmoil, which had previously so shaken it. It was thus made impossible for either party to tread the other underfoot. Against the people and, and the Senate, the kings could do nothing, and it was impossible for the people to gain the upper hand if the Senate made common cause with the kings. Abuse of power. But there was a third case, which Lycurgus le left unconsidered that of the Senate itself abusing its power. The Senate, as intermediary, could as easily join with the kings as with the people, without danger to the public order. But without danger to the public order, the kings could not join the people against the Senate. The Senate, therefore, soon began to exploit this advantage, advantageous situation and make excessive use of its authority, in which it was the more successful 
since the small number of senators made it easy for them to reach agreement among themselves. Lycurgus's successors filled this gap, therefore, and introduced the ephors, who were to reign in, in the power of the Senate. More dangerous and bold was the second change Lycurgus instituted, to do away forever with the distinction between rich and poor. He distributed the entire land of the country in equal parts among the citizens. All Lyconia was divided into 30,000 fields, the area around the city of Sparta itself into 9,000 fields, each sufficiently large that a family could easily sustain itself. Now Sparta was beautiful to behold, and Lycurgus himself delighted in the sight of it as he traveled through the country. All Lyconia, he proclaimed, is a farm uh, brotherly divided among its brothers. Lycurgus would gladly have distributed the other earthly goods as he had the, as he had the farmland, but they, but they were inseparable obstacles. There, there were inseparable obstacles to this plan. He thus attempted to reach this goal by other means, and what he could not change by decree, he took into his own hands. He began by outlawing all gold and silver coins, introducing iron ones in their stead. He likewise assigned a very low value to the large and heavy pieces of iron, so that a large space were needed to store even a small sum of money and many horses to carry it away. Lo and behold, to, ensnare, to, ins, to ensure that no one might be tempted to place any great value on this money and to hoard it on account of the iron in it, he had the, the glowing hot iron, which was used for coins, quenched and tempered in vinegar, which made it unfit for any other use. Who would now steal or allow himself to be corrupted or even consider hoarding wealth for the me meager gain, uh, for the meager gains could be neither kept secret nor employed. Not enough and that Lycurgus thereby deprived his fellow citizens of, means, of the means of luxury. He removed the very objects of the same from their sight and what, uh, the which might have excited their desire for luxury. Sparta's iron coins were of no use uh, to a foreign merchant and the Spartans had no other to give him. Artists who worked for luxury now disappeared from Lyconia. No foreign ships appeared any longer in its ports. No adventurer sought his fortune there. No merchants came to prey upon the vanities and lusts, for they could, for they could carry nothing but iron coins away with them. And in all other countries, these were despised. Luxury ceased to exist, for there was no one to sustain it. In other fields, too, Lycurgus set to work against luxury. He decreed that all citizens eat together in a public place and that they all eat the same prescribed meals. It was not allowed to indulge, the, uh, indulge in delicacies at home, nor to eat luxurious foods prepared by one's own cooks. Everyone was required to contribute a certain sum of money once each month for the food at the common meals, and he received his meal from the state in return. Fifteen persons usually ate together at one table and each guest had to be accepted by his company to be permitted to eat at the common meal. No one was permitted to remain absent without a valid excuse. This part of the decree was upheld so strictly that Aegeus himself, one of the, king, one of the later kings, upon returning from a war gloriously waged, was denied permission by the ephors when he, when he asked to eat with his wife alone at home. Among the Spartan meals, the black soup became famous, a meal of, in, in praise of which it is said the Spartans, had to be, the Spartans had to be courageous, for dying was hardly a worse fate than eating their black soup. <laughs> they spiced their meals with merriment and humor, and Lycurgus himself was so great a friend of social humor that he placed an altar to the god of laughter in his house. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Lycurgus gained much for his, uh, for his purpose by in introducing these social meals. All luxurious delicacies at the dinner table ceased because there was no use for them at a public meal. Gluttony was hated completely. Healthy and strong bodies were the result of this moder moderation and order. The healthy fathers were fit to produce strong progeny for the state. 
And the social meals accustom the citizens to live with each other and to look upon themselves as members of the same state institution, not to speak of the fact, and not to speak of the fact that such a quality in manners of life necessarily exerted influence upon the same emotions. Fashioning citizens. Lycurgus understood quite well that it was not enough to fashion laws for his fellow citizens. He would also need to fashion citizens for these laws. It was in the souls of his Spartans that he would have to anchor his constitution for eternity. In these, he would have to kill the susceptibility of, of, to foreign influences. The most important part of his legislation, therefore, was the provisions made for education. And with these, he closed the circle within which the Spartan state was intended to revolve. Education was an important work of the state and the state a lasting work of this education. His concern for children reached as far as their very reproduction. The bodies of virgins were hardened by exercise to enable them to bear strong and healthy children. They even went naked in order to withstand all inclement weather conditions. The groom had to kidnap his wife and was allowed to visit her only at night and only if he had, kid and only if he had kidnapped her. That meant that for the first year of marriage, the two remained strangers to one another and their love remained new and vital. As soon as the child was born, it belonged to the state. It was examined by the eldest. If, if it were strong and well-formed, it was given over to her nurse. If it was weak and malformed, it was thrown into abyss at the Te Getis mountain. Spartan nurses were famous throughout Greece for the hard edu education they gave the children and were even called into foreign countries. As soon as a boy had reached his seventh year, he was taken from his nurse and educated, fed, and cared for in common with other children his age. He was trained to endure all hardships and to achieve mastery of his limbs through, this, through physical training. Once they had reached the age of young men, the oldest among them had hopes of finding friends among adults who were bound to them through love. The elders were present at their games and observed their blossoming genius and encouraged their thirst for glory by praise or criticism. If they wanted to eat themselves full, the children had to steal food, and hard punishment and shame awaited whoever, whoever was caught. Lycurgus chose this means to accustom them from an early age to deceits and intrigues, qualities he believed as important uh, for the warlike purpose to which he trained them as bodily strength and courage. I have a feeling there's an abridgment here. Dave, am I right? Dave, are you there? Yeah, I was just on mute. Hang on. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was just looked up for one second. Uh, what was the last thing he just read? Uh, bodily strength and courage. And there's a dot, yeah. dot, dot, which I presume means... We have already seen above. Did you read that? That's the next no. line. No. Okay. Uh, no. <clears throat> we have already seen above how unscrupulous Lycurgus was as concerns morality when the achievement of his political purpose was at issue. And one must consider that neither the profanation of marriage nor this command to steal could cause the same political damage in Sparta, which was the consequence of such practices in every other state. Since the state took over the education of the children, it was independent of happiness and purity in marriage. Since in Sparta so little value is placed upon property and nearly all earthly goods were possessed in common. So the security of property was not a very important point and an attack upon it, particularly when the state itself controlled it and attained its own intentions thereby, did not constitute a civil offense. It was forbidden- There we go. That's good. Perfect. It was forbidden to young Spartans to adorn themselves, except when they went into battle or some other great danger. Then they were allowed to do up their hair, adorn their clothes, and carry decorations on their weapons. Hair, so like Kyrgyz, made beautiful people more beautiful and ugly people more fearsome, uh, ugly people fearsome. It was certainly a fine trick of the legislature to connect something humorous and festive with in matters of danger, to take from the people the sense of fear. He went yet further, 
In war, he relaxed the strict discipline somewhat, and lifestyle became freer, and, offen and offenses were less severely punished. Thus it was that war alone was a form of recreation to the Spartans, and they took joy in war as if in a festive occasion. As the enemy approached, the Spartan king ordered the Cantorian chant sung. Soldiers formed the, in closed, closed ranks, accompanied by flutes, and marched joyfully and fearlessly into danger to the sound of the music. Lycurgus's plan also entailed that attachment to property was supplanted by attachment to the fatherland, and that emotions, undiverted by, by any private concerns, only lived for the state. Thus, he thought it good and necessary to also spare his fellow citizens the business of normal life, and to let these affairs be attended to by foreigners, so, uh, so that not even concerns of work, nor the joy of domestic matters, would divert their attentions from the affairs of the fatherland. The farmland and the homes were, therefore, cared for by slaves, who were respected in Sparta as much as cattle. They were called helots because the first uh, of uh, the Spartan slaves had been, inhab been inhabitants of the land of Helos in Laconia, whom the Spartans had subdued in war and made their prisoners. It was from these helots that all later Spartan slaves whom the Spartans exploited in their wars took their names. The use the Spartans made of these unfortunate unfor um, Unfortunates was an abomination. They were looked upon as tools of which one might make use uh, to accomplish one's own political aims, and humanity in them was derided in outrageous ways. To provide Spartan youth to uh, deterrent from the uh, examples of intemperance and drinking, the helots were forced to become drunk, and they were displayed in, condition, in this condition publicly. They were ordered to sing obscene songs and dance ludicrous dances, they were, they were forbidden to dance the dances of the freeborn. They were used to even more, uh, even more in human ends. The state was intent upon putting the courage of its youths to severe tests, thus preparing them for war through these bloody games. Thus, at certain times, the Senate sent a number of these youths into the country. And they were permitted to take nothing but a knife and some food with them on their travels. They were required to remain hidden in the daytime, but at night they took to the streets and beat to death any helots who fell into their hands. This procedure was called the crypta, or ambush, but whether Lycurgus was its originator still lies in doubt. At least it was consistent with his principles. There's another right. dot. Yeah, Dave, I think that you're up. Sorry, Dave, you're, uh, are you there? Yeah, sorry, I just keep muting myself. Um, since they were relieved of all their work, or was it the next paragraph? It was the one before that. Uh, at least it was consistent with his principles was the last thing we read. Mm -hmm. Sorry, yeah, I was- I, I have it here. I looked up from my book, so. Uh, Spartan youth, they were ordered to sing obscene songs and to dance. Da, da, da. Uh, where it goes, you, uh, as the Republic, here I'll, I'll read it. As the Republic of Sparta was successful in war, the number of helots also increased so that they became dangerous to the Republic itself. And indeed, brought to desperation by such barbaric treatment incited insurrection. The Senate passed an inhuman resolution which it believed pardoned by necessity. Once, during the Peloponnesian War, under the pretext of granting their freedom, 2,000 of the most valiant helots were assembled and adorned with wreaths, led into the temple in ceremonious procession. But here they suddenly disappeared, and no one ever learned what happened to them. So much is certain that the Spartan slaves were the most unfortunate among all other slaves, just as the free Spartan citizens uh, were the most free of all the citizens. And then it's back okay. to you. Since they were relieved of all their work by the helots, Spartans spent their lives in indolence. The youth trained in war games and skills, and the adults were the audience and judges of these exercises. 
It was shameful for an older Spartan man to stay away from the place where the youth were trained. And thus each Spartan lived with the state, and all deeds became public deeds. A youth matured under the eyes of the nation and blossomed into old age. Sparta was constantly in the mind, in mind's eye of each Spartan, and Sparta had a him too constantly in its view. He was witness to everything, and everyone was witness to his life. The lust for glory became an incessant spur, ceaselessly feeding the national spirit. The idea of fatherland and the national interest became intertwined with the innermost life of all of its citizens. There's another. Okay. Other occasions to unleash these lusts were the public festivals, and these were quite numerous in indolent Sparta. Warlike folk songs were sung, which usually told of those fallen in battle to the glory of the fatherland, but were encouragements to be courageous. They were sung by three choruses during such festivals, the choruses divided by age. The elders' chorus began to sing, Before time begun, we were heroes. The adult men sang, We are heroes now. Let him come who would test us. The third chorus of the boys then chimed in, Heroes, we shall become, and our deeds shall cast yours into the shadows. If we cast a fleeting... Uh, yeah. Is it like Kyrgyz's legislation? Hmm? That's perfect. Yeah, like Kyrgyz's state. If we cast a fleeting glance at like Kyrgyz's legislation, we are indeed beset with a pleasant uh, amazement. Among all similar institutions of antiquity, his legislation is in, in, incontestably the most accomplished, excepting mosaic legislation, which it resembles in many features and particularly in the principles upon which it is founded. Lycurgus's legislation is really complete in itself. Everything is encompassed by it. Every single thing is bound to every other, and everything is bound together by each single feature. Lycurgus could not have chosen better instruments for the, uh, to accomplish the purpose he had in mind, to create a state isolated from all others, self-sufficient, and capable of sustaining itself through its internal metabolism and its own vital power. No legislator had ever given a state uh, this unity, this national interest, this community spirit, which Lycurgus gave his state. And how did Lycurgus achieve this? By knowing how to direct the activity of his citizens in the state and depriving them of all other paths which might have distracted them from that end. Everything which captivates the human soul and inflames passions, everything except political interests, he banned by law. Wealth and desires, science and art, had no access uh, to the emotions of the Spartans. Comparisons of fortunes, which enkindle in most people the desire for gain, fell to the side displaced by the equality of common poverty. The desire for property dropped away with the opportunity for displaying and employing it. By virtue of the lack of knowledge in science and art, which clouded all minds in Sparta in the same way, he spared Sparta the intervention which an enlightened mind had made in the, consti had made in the constitution. Just this impoverishment of knowledge combined with raw national pride, characteristic of every Spartan, always stood in the way of the Spartans' intercourse with other Greek people. They were stamped as Spartans from the cradle, and the more they came up against other nations, the more they had to hold firm to their own. The fatherland was the first theater present and presented to the view of a Spartan boy from the moment when he began to think. He awoke in the womb of the state, all that surrounded him was nation, state, and fatherland. This was the first impression of his mind, and his entire life was a perpetual renewal of this impression. At home, the Spartans found nothing which might fascinate him, and the legislator had deprived his eyes of all incitements. Only in the womb of the state did he find employment, amusement, honor, reward. All his desires and passions were directed to his central point, to this central point. The state took possession of all the energy 
the powers of each of its individual citizens. And it was upon the spirit of community that the community spirit of each individual enkindled itself. Thus, it is no wonder that Spartan national virtue ultimately attained a degree of strength which must seem inconceivable to us. And thus it was that there could, eh, could, be, eh, could be no doubts among the citizens concerning this republic when the choice was posed between self-preservation and saving the fatherland. And so we may understand how the Spartan King Leonidas, with his 300 heroes, could merit the inscription on his tombstone, the most beautiful of its kind, and the most sublime monument to political virtue. Tell, you travelers, when you are come to Sparta, that we obey its laws and here are fallen. Thus, one, uh, one must concede that nothing could be more purposeful, nothing more thought out than this state constitution, and that it represents an accomplished work of art of its own kind, and following in its full rigor, one which necessarily rest, rested its, uh, upon itself alone. But were I to end my description here, I had committed a very serious mistake. The most remarkable constitution is con contemptible to the highest degree, and nothing more sad could befall humanity than that all states should be founded on this model. It would not be difficult to convince ourselves of this assertion. In respect of the purpose set forth, Lycurgus's legislation is a masterpiece of, of statecraft and humancraft. He wanted a powerful state founded upon itself and in indestructible political strength and longevity were the aims for which he strove. And he achieved these aims to the extent possible under the conditions he confronted. But if one compares the aims Lycurgus set himself with the aims of mankind, then profound disapproval must take the place of the admiration which our first fleeting glance enticed from us. Everything may be sacrificed for the best of the state, but not that which serves the state uh, itself only as an instrument. The state itself is never the purpose. It is important only as the condition under which the purpose of mankind may be fulfilled. And this purpose of mankind is none other than the development of all the powers of people, i.e. progress. If the constitution of a state hinders the progress of the mind, it is contemptible and harmful, however well thought out it may otherwise be, and however accomplished a work of its kind. Its longevity then serves the more to reproach it than to celebrate its glory. It is then merely a prolonged evil. The longer it exists, the more harmful it is. In general, we can establish a rule for judging political institutions that they are only good and laudable to the extent that they bring all forces inherent in persons to flourish to the extent that they promote the progress in culture, or at least not hinder it. This rule applies to religious laws as well as to political ones. Both are contemptible if they constrain a power of the human mind they impose upon the mind any sort of stagnation. A law, for example, by which a nation were forced to persist in a certain scheme of belief, which at a particular time appeared to, be, appeared to it most fitting, such a law were an assault against mankind, and laudable intents of whatever kind were then incapable of justifying it. It were immediately directed against the highest good, against the highest purpose of society. Armed with this standard, we shall not long be in, the, be in a quandary about how we shall judge Lycurgus's state. One single virtue, displacing all others, was exercised in Sparta, love of fatherland. It was uh, to this ar artificial impulse that the most natural and most beautiful emotions of mankind were sacrificed. Political merit was sought at the expense of all moral emotions. And, all, uh, and the capacity to attain this political merit was the only capability it inculcated. In Sparta, there was no martial, uh, marital love, no mother's love, no child's love, no friendship. There were nothing but citizens and nothing but the virtues of, and, and the virtue of citizens. 
Spartan mothers were admired, who, in annoyance, shunned their sons returning from battle. Mothers who had hurried into the temple to thank the god for those fallen in battle. One would hardly wish such unnatural strength of mind upon mankind. A tender mother is a far more beautiful phenomenon than a moral world uh, eh, in a moral world than heroic herm uh, hermaphrodic creature. Aphroditic? Which, I don't know. <laughs> hermaphroditic <laughs> creature. Hermaphroditic, yeah. There you go. Hermaphroditic creature, yeah. thank you. Which spurns natural emotions to fulfill an artificial duty. All right, we got three dots. <laughs> Dave? Sorry, what more beautiful theater is there than that of the rough warrior Gaius Marius in his encampment at the gates of Rome, who sacrifices vengeance and victory because he cannot bear to see his mother's tears flow? Since the state became the father of children, the natural father ceased to be it. The child never learned to love its mother, its father, because it was torn from them at the most tender age. It never knew its parents by their care for him, but only by hearsay. Universal human emotions were smothered in Sparta. I think, yeah, I think oh, that's, that's it. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Universal human emotions were smothered in Sparta in a way yet more outrageous. And the soul of all duties, respect for the species, was irrevocable. Uh, irrevo Cobbly lost. A law made it a duty of the Spartans to treat their slaves inhumanely, and in these unfortunate victims of and in these unfortunate victims of butchery, humanity was cursed and abused. The Spartan Book of Law itself preached the dangerous principle that people be considered as means, not as ends. The foundations of natural law and morality were thereby torn asunder by law. Morality was utterly sacrificed to obtain, obtain something which can only be valuable as a means to this morality. Progress ended. Can anything be more contradictory? Can, anything contra can any contradiction have more grievous consequences than this? Not enough that Lycurgus founded his state on the ruin of morality in an entirely different way too he worked against the highest purpose of humanity in that through his well thought out system of state, he held the minds of, of the Spartans fast at the level where he had found them and hemmed in all progress for eternity. All industry was banned, all science neglected, all trade with foreign peoples forbidden, everything foreign was excluded. All channels were thereby closed, through which his nation might have obtained more enlightened ideas. The Spartan state was intended to resolve solely, uh, revolve solely around itself in perpetual uniformity, in a sad egoism. The business of all citizens together was to maintain what they possessed and to remain as they were, not to obtain anything new, not to arise to a higher level. Unrelenting laws were to stand watch then no innovation to take grip on the clockwork of the state, that the very progress of, the, of time changed nothing in the form of the laws. To make this condition perpetual, it was necessary to hold the mind of the people at the level where they stood when the state was founded. But we have seen that progress of mind should be the purpose of the state. And Lycurgus's state could persist under but one condition, that the mind of the peoples uh, stagnate, and uh, he was thus only able to sustain his state by trespassing against the highest and only purpose for the state. Thus, what is cited in praise of Lycurgus, that Sparta would only flourish as long as it followed the letter of its laws, it, it is, the worst one, uh, is the worst one might say about it. For the very reason, that it was not permitted to relinquish the old form of state which Lycurgus had given it without exposing itself to its own destruction, that it had to remain what it was, that it had to stand where one single man had cast it. For that reason, Sparta was an unhappy state, and its legislator could not have given it a sadder gift. 
than this uh, renowned eternal longevity of a constitution, which so stood in the way of its true greatness and happiness. If we take this together, the false glitter disappears, whereby a single outstanding feature of the Spartan state uh, blinds uh, the inex an, uh, an inexperienced eye. We see nothing more than a callow, imperfect attempt, the first exercise of the world at a young age, which still lacked experience and brighter insights to recognize the true relationship of things. As defective as this first attempt turned out, it will and must remain something noteworthy for a philosophical investigator of the history of man. It was ever a giant step of the human mind to treat, uh, uh, to treat of a subject as a work of art, which up to now had been left for the fortuitous consideration, to fortuitous consideration and passion. The first attempt in, in, in the most difficult uh, of uh, all the arts was necessarily imperfect, but we treasure it still because it was an attempt in the most important of all arts. Sculptors began to carve the pillars of Hermes before they rose up to the, perf uh, the perfected form of the Antinous, uh, uh, a Vatican Apollo. Lawgivers were exercised their attempts for a yet a long time until the happy balance of social forces ultimately comes forth to meet them, uh, to meet them of their own. Stones, uh, stone suffers the work of the chisel patiently the string struck by the musician answers him without resisting his fingers. It is only the legislator who works upon a material which is active and resistant of its own accord, human freedom. He can accomplish the ideal only imperfectly, however pure he may have, uh, design, uh, have designed it in his mind. But here the attempt alone is worthy of all praise. If it is undertaken, in, the dis in, in disinterested benevolence and purpose, uh, purposefully accomplished. Okay, all right. So yeah. here we're gonna switch gears a little bit. Um, now that we've treated fully um, Sparta's constitution and culture that, that came out of that intention, uh, now we're gonna look at Solon a few hundred years later. I just wanted to add one quick thing here that struck me because Irene uh, Eckert just delivered this really great presentation on Schiller versus the Congress for Cultural Freedom a few weeks ago. And she made the point that Schiller was really attacked by the CIA's Congress for Cultural Freedom after World War II with the argument, get this, that Schiller's theories, which so deeply shaped German culture, caused Nazism. <laughs> that's actually, that was their logic. And that's why they, they were like, we have to extract uh, Schiller from the German soul. And that there's even that quote she cited from, uh, from Churchill saying that that is the, the true uh, enemy we have to destroy is, is the Schillerian spirit. He uh, said but, that? Did he, nope. he said Schillerian spirit? I'm paraphrasing. That's not the exact words, but uh, Irene uh, cited a quote by a Russian academician uh, uh, citing this, this uh, Churchill quote, which I've never read with my own eyes. It's only been something I've, I've heard from a secondary source. All that to say, that was the effect of the CCF um, and replacing it with this ugly worshipping of modern post postmodernist art, which was just a, a new cult of ugliness masquerading as beauty uh, to replace this classical beauty, uh, beauty in, the, in, the, in the German culture. So... Just keep that in mind, because what we just read is the most anti-fascist uh, <laughs> exposition condemning exactly what Hitler was activating, you know? Like, he's, he's directly intervening on, on what uh, the Germans fell into and what our society, in many ways, we see, I think we could all sort of see elements of what Schiller is warning about regarding this idea of a closed, static so uh, society, right, that would just destroy the the power of the mind to move to be creative to love to ha access these human emotions so it's I, mean, uh, I, I feel like there are a few things that are worth i mean it's worth maybe just talking about what we just read a bit before we go in into the next just because okay. it is like yeah we, we can talk about this one at the end of solon i mean this this makes me think of a lot of things uh, like you said matt in terms of how people are thinking today 
mm-hmm. but it's 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 interesting as well because it's kind of this Lycurgian response is kind of what we're you get as the the response to the disgust with the the extreme liberalism you get the extreme type of spartan uh fascist response as well right where it's like this is what happens these are the dangers of liberalism right when things are kind of like opened up and people start reinterpreting things right that that's the the idea and uh, so you have to have these strict dogmas but schiller makes the point that like they made laws that were fitting for one moment or at one time but then as the times changed you know the laws no longer applied but they had this this formalism this ironclad system right this dogma and so it doesn't it doesn't work in a universe that's always changing so there's two scales and i i think that's what most people always get confused on there's the unchanging right dr kwan talks about the the kairos and then there's the changing right there's the tempus there's there's the real there's the reality which is always in flux yeah, yeah, yeah nothing is constant but constant change and i think most people the confusion always arises from mistaking those two scales right these un- eternal unchanging laws which we always have to be committed to further developing which schiller talks about as uh, the development of the human soul and then there's the actual laws for any given moment um, for society to function on a practical level and those are different they're different but they're they, they intersect yeah and as soon as we try try to just impose uh, a dogma and we can no longer distinguish the the principles from the practical uh realities we we get this kind of it it can become fascist quite easily right as soon as mm-hmm. things start to not work mm-hmm. well it's like yeah like cuz you were you reminded me at the very beginning that there was this state of anarchy and decadence right that he was correcting that the state had become ungovernable by what had happened before like hergus entered the scene yeah. Right. I forgot about that. Yeah. There was this, the population was decadent. They were chaotic. There was, there was uh, revolts happening. Kings were trying to appeal to both the Senate and the people. And anyway, there was just like insanity. And so there was this need to, on, on the one hand, restore order, but then the act of restoring order created this other new problem, <laughs> maybe even worse than the first problem of just like, all right, we'll have this crystallized cage of like structure and how to get everybody back into good behavior. But then that, that became this perpetual machine. Um, yeah. Sort of it, like- reminded, it kind of reminded me of a GK Chesterton quote I once heard about, uh, if you, uh, if you break the big laws, you do not get freedom. You do not get anarchy. You get the small laws. I was, that was <laughs> That's great. Yeah. That's good. That's, That's good. a good point. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Okay, um, so long. I saw I saw Ryan just took himself off mute. Ryan, did you have a thought? Uh, not really, because I had uh, some noise running in the background, so it's just. Uh, using oh, okay. All right, cool. All right, uh, so let's do an yeah. Maybe we'll switch up the readers. Um, so now that we're gonna study Solon, who wants to pick it up? I can read. Sure. Unless someone else wants to read. Go ahead. Okay. Let's fix my book here. Solon's legislation in Athens was nearly the complete opposite of Lycurgus's in Sparta. And since the two republics of Sparta and Athens play the major roles in Greek history, it is an attractive enterprise to compare their two state constitutions and to weigh their defects and advantages against one another. After the death of Codrus, the office of king was abolished in Athens and its power transferred to an authority who bore the name of Archon, Archon, who held the office for life. In a span of time of more than 300 years, 13 such Archons ruled in Athens. But history has preserved to us nothing noteworthy about the new republic over this span of time. But the spirit of democracy, characteristic of the Athenians, even in Homer's time, stirred once more at the close of this period. The lifelong duration of the Arcanate was an all too vivid image of the royal authority 
and previous archons had perhaps abused this great and long-lasting power. The archon's time in office was thus reduced to 10 years, an important step toward future freedom. Since by electing a new ruler every 10 years, the people renewed its act of sovereignty, even 10 years, its act of sovereignty. Every 10 years, it took back its bequeathed authority, then to relinquish it anew as it saw fit. That served to keep fresh in memory what the subjects of hereditary monarchies ultimately forget entirely, that the people are the source of supreme authority, that the prince is but a creature of the nation. For 300 years, the Athenian people had tolerated a lifelong archon over itself, but it became tired of the 10-year archons in only 70 years. This was quite natural. For seven times had it been reminded of its sovereignty. The spirit of freedom, therefore, stirred more lively, developed more quickly in the second period than in the first. The seventh of the 10-year archons was also the last of this kind. The people wanted to enjoy their supreme authority every year, for they had experienced that an authority conferred for 10 years endured long enough to be a temptation to abuse that authority. In the future, the office of Archon was to be held for one single year at the end of which new elections were held. Since even such a brief duration of authority in the hands of one single person comes quite close to a monarchy, the people attenuated this authority, distributing it among nine Archons who govern simultaneously. Three of these nine archons had privileges over the other six. The first, called Archon Eponymous, chaired the assembly. His name was entered in the public documents and the year was named after him. The second, called Basilius or King, was to watch over religious matters and to hold religious services. This was held over from earlier times when supervision of religious services had been an essential prerogative of the office of the king. The third polemarch was the commander in war. The six others bore the name of Thesmothes because they were to uphold the constitution and the laws and to interpret them. The archons were elected from the most prominent families and it was only in late, later times that persons from the common people came into these offices. The constitution, therefore, was closer to an aristocracy than a people's government. And so the people themselves ultimately gained little from the changes. The arrangement that nine archons were elected anew each year had, in addition to its good side, preventing the abuse of supreme authority, also a very bad side. And this was that it brought forth factions into the state. For now, there were many citizens in the state who had exercised supreme authority and relinquished it. Having given up their office, they would not so easily lay aside their taste for this office, not for their initial enjoyment in ruling. So they decided to again become what they had once been, secured a following, and incited domestic storms in the Republic. The quick alteration and the large number of archons, furthermore, encouraged every reputable and rich Athenian to seek to become archons, a hope which he had hardly entertained, if at all, had only one person assume this office, one who would not be replaced so soon. So both those who had already been archons, as well as those who yearned to become archon, became equally dangerous to the public order. <clears throat> the worst of it all was that the authoritative power had been broken by its distribution among many persons and being of such short duration. So a strong hand was lacking to restrain the factions and to rein in the insurrectionary heads. Powerful and audacious citizens threw the state into confusion and strove for independence. Eyes ultimately fell upon an irreproachable and generally feared citizen to bring this disorder under control one to whom powers were granted to improve the laws, which up to that time consisted but in defective traditions. Draco was this feared citizen, a man bereft of human sentiments, who believed human nature capable of nothing good 
who saw all deeds but in the dark mirror of his own cheerless soul and was utterly lacking in indulgence for the weaknesses of humanity. A bad philosopher and an even worse judge of man, with a cold heart, a narrow mind, and unwavering in his prejudices. Such a man was excellently suited <clears throat> to implement laws, but to give laws a worse choice were hardly possible. Little of Draco's laws have been left to us, but this little describes us the man and the spirit of his legislation. All crimes, without distinction, he punished with death, indolence, as well as murder, theft of charcoal or a sheep, high treason and arson. When he was asked why he punished the lesser offenses as severely as the most grievous crimes, he answered, the smallest of crimes are deserving of death. For the greater crimes, I know of no other punishment than death. So I treat both equally. Enlightened guy. Yeah. <laughs> Draco's laws are the attempt of a novice in the art of governing men. Fear is the only instrument through which they take effect. He only punishes an offense committed. He does not prevent it. He takes no care to close off the sources of offense and to improve people. To snuff out the life of a man because he has committed an evil act is as much as to cut down a tree because its fruit is foul. His laws are doubly contemptible because they have not only the sacred sentiments and rights of man against them, but also because they were not framed for the people to whom they were given. Were any people in the world unlikely to flourish under such laws, the Athenian people certainly were. The slaves of the pharaohs or of the king of kings might eventually have settled with them. But how could Athenians bow under such a yoke? And they remained in force, and they remained in force, hardly a half century, although he had given them the immodest title of immutable laws. Draco thus fulfilled his mission very badly. And instead of being useful, his laws only caused, caused damage. Since they were not to be obeyed, and there was as yet no others to put in their stead, it was as if Athens had no laws at all, and anarchy most sad tore in upon them. The condition of the Athenian people at that time was lamentable in the extreme. One class of people possessed everything, the other, on the other hand, nothing at all. The rich mercilessly repressed and exploited the poor. An impenetrable wall grew between them. <clears throat> Distress forced the poor citizens to flee to the rich for relief, to the very leeches who had drained them. At their hands, they found but gruesome relief. For the sums they borrowed, they had to pay immense interest. And if they did not pay on time, they were forced to sell even their lands to their creditors. When they had nothing more to give and yet had to live, they were forced to sell their own children as slaves. And finally, when this recourse too was exhausted, they took credit, secured on their own persons, and had to accept being sold by their creditors as slaves. There was as yet no law in Attica against this abominable slave trade, and nothing held the gruesome greed of the rich citizens in check. So horrible were conditions in Athens. Were the state not to be destroyed, this disrupted balance of goods would have to be reestablished by violent means. <clears throat> to this end, three factions had emerged among the people. The one, which the poor citizens particularly joined, demanded a democracy, an equal distribution of farmland as Lycurgus had introduced in Sparta. The other faction, consist consisting of the rich citizens, argued for aristocracy. The third faction wanted to see the two forms of state combined and oppose the other two factions so that no one faction won out. <clears throat> there was no hope of settling this strife calmly as long as no one was found to whom all three parties would submit and whose mediation over them they would acknowledge. Fortunately, such a man was found and his services on behalf of the Republic, his gentle and reasonable character and the renown of his wisdom had for a long time drawn the eyes of the nation to him. 
This man was Solon of royal lineage is like Hergis, for he counted Codrus among his forebears. Solon's father had been a very rich man, but had reduced his wealth through the charity, and the young Solon had to become a merchant in his younger years. His spirit was enriched by the travels which this kind of life made necessary, and by the intercourse with foreign peoples, and his genius developed an acquaintance with the wise men of foreign countries. <clears throat> Very early, he devoted himself to the poet's art, and the skill he achieved in it served him well in later life, in cloaking moral truths and political rules in these pleasing robes. His heart was sensitive to join love. Certain weaknesses in his youth made him the more considerate toward mankind, and lent his laws the character of gentleness and tenderness which so beautifully distinguished them from the laws of Draco and Lycurgus. He had also been a valiant commander, had captured the island of Salamis for the Republic, and performed other important deeds of war. At that time, the study of wisdom was not yet separated from its political and military effects, as it is now. The wise man was the best statesman, the most experienced soldier. His wisdom flowed into all business of public life. Solon's reputation resounded throughout Greece, and he enjoyed great influence in the general affairs of the Peloponnese. Solon was the man who was equally esteemed by all the parties in Athens. The rich placed great hopes in him, for he was himself a man of wealth. The poor trusted him because he was a righteous man. The justice among the Athenians wanted him to be their ruler. The judicious among the Athenians wanted him to be their ruler because monarchy seemed the best means to suppress the factions. His relatives wished this also, but for selfish reasons, to share the rule with him. Solon rejected this advice. Monarchy, he said, was a beautiful house to live in, but there was no exit from it. He contented himself with being named Archon, Archon and lawgiver and assumed this office reluctantly and only out of concern for the welfare of the citizens. The first act which he began to work was the famous edict called Saisaketeia, or the release, whereby all debts were annulled, and it was forbidden at the same time that in the future anyone be permitted to borrow on his own person. This edict was naturally a violent assault upon property but the most urgent need of the state made a violent step necessary. It was the lesser of two evils, for the class of people which suffered from it was far smaller than the, those whom it made happy. By this beneficent edict, he did away at once with the heavy burdens which had pressed down the poor class for centuries. But the rich did not become poor as a consequence, for he left them everything they had, and only took from them the means to be unjust. Nevertheless, from the poor he harvested as little gratitude as from the rich. The poor had expected a fully equal distribution of the land, for which Sparta was the example, and therefore grumbled against him, that he had betrayed their hopes. They forgot that the lawgiver owed justice to the rich as to the poor, and that the arrangement of Lycurgus was unworthy of imitation just for the reason that it was founded upon an injustice which had been avoidable. The ingratitude of the people forced a modest complaint from the lawgiver. <clears throat> Formerly, he said, praise well that me from all sides. Now everyone looks upon me with hostile glances. Soon, however, the salutary effects of his edict began to manifest themselves. The land previously worked by slaves was now free. The citizens worked the land as his own property. The citizen worked his own land as the property, which he had previously worked for his creditor. Many Athenians, sold into foreign countries, who had already begun to forget their mother tongue, saw their fatherland once again as free men. Confidence was reestablished in the lawgiver. He was commissioned with the entire reform of the state and had unlimited authority to dispose of the property and rights of the citizens. The first use which he made of his powers was to abolish all of Draco's laws, except those against murder, 
and the breach of marriage. Now he undertook the great work of giving the Republic a new constitution. All Athenians had to submit to a census of their fortunes, and after the census they were divided into four classes, or guilds. The first was comprised of those who had an annual income of 500 measures of dry and fluid goods. The second consisted of those who had an income of 300 measures of these goods and a horse. The third were those who only had half as much and were two fortune and where two fortunes had to be combined to make up this sum. They were therefore called the two team. In the fourth class were those who owned no land and live and lived only from their craft work, craftsmen, wage earners, and artists. The first three classes could assume public offices. Those from the last class were excluded from public office, but had one vote in the National Assembly, as all the others, and for that reason alone, had a large share in the government. All major issues were brought before the National Assembly, called the Ecclesia, and also decided by this assembly. The election of magistrates, assignments to offices, important affairs in law, financial affairs, war, and peace. Since, furthermore, Solon's, Solon's laws were afflicted with a certain obscurity in each case where a judge was in doubt about the interpretation of the law, appeal had to be made to the Ecclesia, which made the final decision about how the law was to be understood. The appeal to the people could be made from all tribunals. No one was allowed into the National Assembly before the age of 30 years, but as soon as someone had reached the required age, he could not absent himself from the assembly without incurring punishment, for Solon hated and fought against nothing more than indifference to the common weal. In this way, the constitution of Athens was transformed into a complete democracy. In the strict sense, the people was sovereign, and it ruled not merely through represent representatives, but in its own and but in its own person and by itself. But soon the disadvantageous consequences of this arrangement became evident. The people had become powerful too soon to wield this privilege with moderation. Passion mingled in the public assembly, and the tumult, which soon a large number of people excited, did not always permit mature deliberation and wise decision. To obviate this effect, Solon created a senate into which were taken a hundred members from each of the four guilds. The Senate had to deliberate previously on the issues which were to be laid before the Ecclesia. Nothing which had not previously been taken into consideration by the Senate was permitted to be taken before the people, but the people alone decided. Once an issue had been presented to the people by the Senate, then the speakers rose to influence their decision. This class of people attained to great importance in Athens and did as much damage to the Republic by the abuse they made of their art and of the easily swayed minds of the Athenians as they might have contributed if free of private ambitions, they had had the true interests of the state always in mind. The speakers summoned up all the contrivances of eloquence to make the side of an issue appear best to the people which they most favored themselves. And if a speaker were a master of his art, all hearts were in his hands. The people were laid in gentle and permitted chains by these speakers, and their rule was no less by virtue of their leaving something to the decision of a free vote. The people retained the full freedom to elect or reject, but by the art employed to present issues to the people, its freedom was controlled. A most excellent arrangement if the function of the speakers had always remained in pure and loyal hands. But soon these speakers became sophists who staked their fame on making the bad appear good and the good bad. In the center of Athens, there was a large public square surrounded by statues of the gods and heroes called the Pritanium. The Senate met on this square and for that reason, the senators were called Pritanes. The Pritanes were required to lead irreproachable lives. No spendthrift 
no one who had treated his father irreverently, no one who had become drunk even once, might even conceive of seeking this office. As the population of Athens increased, and instead of the four guilds which Solom had introduced, ten were established, the number of Pritans was increased from 400 to 1,000. But of these thousand Pritans, only 500 were active in a given year. And even these 500, never all at once. 50 of them governed for five weeks, such that in any given week, only 10 were in office. Thus, it was entirely impossible to make decisions arbitrarily, for each of the Pritans had as many witnesses and custodians of his actions as he had fellow officials. And the successor, was always able to criticize the administration of his predecessor. Every five weeks, four popular assemblies were held, not counting the extraordinary sessions, an arrangement which made it entirely impossible that an issue remained long undecided and the process of business delayed. In addition to the Senate of Pritanes, which he newly created, Solon, also reestablished the authority of the Areopagus, which Draco had degraded. He made it the supreme keeper and guardian spirit of the laws and tied the Republic to these two courts. As Plutarch says, the Senate and the Areopagus as the two, as the two anchors. The two courts were established to guard over the preservation of the state and its laws. Ten other tribunals took care of the application of the laws, the execution of justice. There were four courts dealing with murder cases, the Palladium, the Delphinium, the Phraites, and the Helia. The existence of the first two, Solon only confirmed, for they had already been established under the kings. Unpremeditated murders were judged before the Palladium. The Phraites court was called upon to speak judgment over those accused of premeditated murder after they had already fled the country on account of an unpremeditated murder. The defendant appeared on a ship and his judges stood on the shore. If the defendant was innocent, he returned to his place of exile. If in the joyous hope of returning home one day, if he was found guilty, he returned into exile unharmed, but he had lost his fatherland forever. The fourth criminal court was the Helia, or the Helia, which took its name from the sun, because it usually convened just after sunrise, and at a place where the sun shone. The Helia was an extraordinary tribunal of the other great tribunals. Its members were at once judges and magistrates. It existed not only to apply and execute laws, but also to improve them and to interpret them. Its assembly was ceremonious, and a gruesome oath bound its members to uphold the truth. As soon as death, as soon as a death sentence was spoken, and the defendant had not chosen to escape it by voluntary going into exile, he was handed over to the eleven men. This was the name of the commission to which each of the 10 guilds delegated one man. These 10 together with the executioner made 11. These 11 men were the guardians of the prison and carried out the death sentence. The forms of death conceived for criminals in Athens were of three kinds. Either the criminal was thrown into a gorge or into the sea, or he was executed with a sword or he was given hemlock to drink. That seems like four ways, but that's maybe just me. Before the death penalty, there came banishment. This punishment is horrible in happy countries. There are states where it is no misfortune to be banished. That banishment came before the death penalty, and if it were forever, it was equivalent to death. It's a beautiful testimony to the self-conception of the Athenian people. The Athenian who lost his country was unable to find another Athens anywhere the world over. Banishment also entailed the confiscation of all property, except in the case of ostracism. Citizens who, either on account of particular merit or, or fortune, had attained to greater influence and reputation than compatible with republican 
equality were temporarily banished before they had this deserved it. To save the state, one was unjust toward individual citizens. The idea behind this custom is laudable in itself, but the means chosen manifests a childish policy. This form of banishment was called ostracism because the vote was made on shards of pottery. 6,000 votes were necessary to impose this punishment upon a citizen. Ostracism by its nature necessarily affected the meritorious citizen and therefore honored him more than it shamed him. But it was no less unjust on that account and gruesome for it deprived him who is the most worthy of what was dearest to him. His homeland. A fourth kind of punishment of criminal offenses was the punishment of the pillars. The criminal's guilt was written upon a pillar and this dishonored him and his entire family. Six tribunals existed to decide lesser civil offenses, but they never became important because those convicted could always appeal to the higher courts and to the ecclesia. Everyone represented his own case. Women, children, and slaves accepted. A water clock determined the length of his and his accusers' arguments. The most important of these civil offenses had to be decided within 24 hours. So much for the civil and political institutions of Solon, but the legislator did not limit himself to these alone. The advantage the ancient legislators had over more recent ones is that they framed their laws for the people who would be governed by them. That they also took account of the character of social relationships and never severed the citizen from the human being as we do. Among us, it is not seldom that the laws are in direct contradiction to morality. Among the ancients, laws and morality stood in a more beautiful harmony. Their body politic, therefore, had a warmth of vitality, which ours lacks. The state was inscribed in the souls of its citizens with indestructible strokes. One must, however, be very cautious in praise of antiquity. One may generally say that the intentions of the ancient legislators were wise and laudable, but that they were in want of means. The means applied often manifested wrong ideas and a biased form of conception. Where we remain too far behind, they hasten too far forward. If our legislators have been wrong to entirely neglect moral duties and morality, the Greek legislators were wrong in that they enjoined moral duties with the force of law. The first condition for the moral beauty of deeds is freedom of will. And this freedom is gone as soon as one wants to enforce moral virtue by punishment under law. The most noble privilege of human nature is to decide for itself and do what is good for the sake of the good. No civil law may command loyalty toward friends, generosity toward the enemy, gratitude to father and mother. For as soon as it does so, a free moral sentiment becomes a work of fear a slavish impulse. But once more, we return to our Solon. One of Solon's laws decreed that every citizen consider an insult against another person to be directed at himself, and that he shall not rest until the insult has been avenged. The law is an excellent one considering Solon's intent. His intent was to imbue the citizen with a warm sympathy for all others, and to accustom all together to look upon each other as members of a cohesive whole. How pleasantly surprised we would be if we came into a country where every passerby, uncalled for, stood to protect us against someone who had insulted us. But much of our pleasure were lost, were we told at the same time that our protector had been compelled to act so beautifully. Yeah. Another law which Solon enacted declared anyone without honor if he remained neutral in an insurrection. This law, too, was based upon an unmistakably good intention. The legislator's concern was to instill in the citizen the most ardent interest in the state. To him, indifference toward the fatherland was the most hateful quality of his citizens. Neutrality can often be the consequence of this indifference. But he forgot that the most fervent interest in the fatherland often compels one to neutrality. For example, when both sides are in the wrong. 
and the fatherland would lose as much by either side. Another of Solon's laws forbids speaking ill of the dead. Another prohibits speaking ill of a living person in public places, in court, in a temple, or in the theater. Solon releases a bastard from filial responsibilities, for the father, he says, has been paid enough by the sensuous lust he enjoyed. He likewise frees the son of the responsibility for feeding his father, if the latter had not permitted the son to learn an art. He permitted testaments to be made and properties given away at this, as the person chose. Since friends whom one chooses, he said, are worth more than mere relatives. He abolished dowries because he wanted love and not selfishness to be the reason for marriage. Yet another fine touch of tenderness in his character is that he gave milder names to hated things. Taxes were called contributions. Military garrisons were guardians of the city. Prisons were chambers. And the cancellation of debts was the release. Luxury, which the Athenian enjoyed so much, he moderated by wise decrees. Strict laws guarded over the morality of women, over the relations between the two sexes and the sanctity of marriage. These laws he decreed should be enforced only for a hundred years. How much further he saw than Lycurgus. He understood that laws are but servants of education and that nations in their adulthood require a different guide than in their childhood. Lycurgus perpetuated the childhood of the minds of the Spartans, thereby to perpetuate his laws among them but his state disappeared with its laws. Solon, on the other hand, expected his laws to last only a hundred years, and many of them are still enforced to this day in Roman law books. Time is a just judge of merit. Solon has been accused of having given the people too much authority, and the accusation is not unfounded. By steering too far wide of one reef, oligarchy, he ran too close to another anarchy, but yet only too close for the Senate of Pritanes and the court of Areopagus were strong grains upon democratic authority. The evils, which are inseparable from a democracy, tumultuous and impassioned decisions, and the spirit of faction were obviously unavoidable in Athens. But these evils are to be attributed more to the form which he chose than to the essence of democracy. It was a severe mistake that he let the people decide in person rather than through representatives, which could not proceed without tumult and confusion on account of the large number of people without wealth. Ostracism, for which at least 6,000 votes are required, allows us to glean how stormy such popular assemblies may have been. On the other hand, if one considers how familiar even the most common Athenian was with the affairs of the commonweal, how powerfully patriotism worked in him, how much the legislator had taken care that the fatherland was the most important thing to every citizen, one will obtain a better idea of the political understanding of the Athenian populace and also beware of premature conclusions about their common people, judging by our own. All large assemblies always have a certain lawlessness in their consequence but all smaller assemblies have trouble keeping themselves pure of aristocratic despotism. To hit a happy mean between the two is the most difficult problem, which coming centuries shall have to solve. To me, the spirit remains admirable with which Solon was inspired in his legislation, the spirit of healthy and genuine statecraft, which never lost sight of the fundamental principles upon which all states must rest to give unto oneself the laws which are to be obeyed and to fulfill the responsibilities of the citizens out of insight and out of love of the fatherland, not out of slavish fear of punishment, not out of blind and feeble submission to the will of a higher authority. Beautiful and fitting it was of Solon that he had respect for human nature and never sacrificed people to the state never the end to the means, rather let the state serve the people. His laws were loose bonds in which the minds of the citizens move freely and easily in all directions and never perceived that the bonds 
were directing them. The laws of Lycurgus were iron chains in which bold courage chafed itself bloody, which pulled down the mind by their pressing weight. All possible paths were opened, all possible paths were opened by the Athenian legislator to the genius and diligence of his citizens. The Spartan legislator walled off all of his citizens' potentials, except one, political service. Lycurgus decreed indolence by law. Solon punished it severely. In Athens, therefore, all virtues matured. Industry and art flourished. The blessing of diligence abounded. All fields of knowledge were cultivated. Where in Sparta does one find a Socrates, a Thucydides, a Sophocles, and Plato? Sparta was capable of producing only rulers and warriors. No artists, no poets, no thinkers, no world citizens. Both Solon and Lycurgus were great men. Both were righteous men. But how different were their effects since they proceeded from principles diametrically opposed? The Athenian legislator is surrounded by freedom and joy, diligence and superfluity, surrounded by all the arts and virtues, all the graces and muses, who look up to him in gratitude and call him father and creator. About Lycurgus, one sees nothing but tyranny, its horrible partner, slavery, which shakes its chains and flees the cause of its misery. The character of an entire people is the most faithful impression of its laws, and thus also the surest judge of its value or lack thereof. Limited was the mind of the Spartan, and insensitive his heart. He was proud and haughty toward his fellows, severe toward the vanquished, inhuman toward his slaves, and slavish toward his superiors. In his transactions, he was unscrupulous and faithless, despotic in his decisions, and his greatness, even his virtue, lacked the pleasing grace which alone wins hearts. The Athenian, quite the contrary, was gentle and tender of behavior, politely intelligent in discussion, kind to inferiors, hospitable and helpful to foreigners. He loved delicacies and finery, but that did not prevent him from fighting like a lion in battle. Clothed in purple, in scented oils, he brought Xerxes' millions and the raw Spartans alike to tremble. He loved the pleasures of the table, but only with difficulty resisted the lures of lust. The gluttony and shameless behavior brought dishonor in Athens. Delicacy and decorum were more practiced by no other people in antiquity than the Athenians. In the war with Philip of Macedon, the Athenians had captured a number of the king's letters, among them also one to his wife. All others were open. This one was returned unopened. The Athenian was generous in fortune and steadfast in misfortune. It cost him nothing to dare everything for the fatherland. He treated his slaves humanly and a mistreated slave was permitted to accuse the tyrant in court. Even animals experienced the generosity of this people. After the construction of the temple of Hecatopedon was completed, it was decreed that all beasts of burden employed in the construction were to be freed to feed themselves at no cost for the rest of their lives upon the best meadows. Later, one of these animals came to work of his own and ran mechanically around the other animals. This sight so touched the Athenians that they decreed special treatment in the future for this animal at the cost of the state. I owe it to justice, however, not to remain silent about the defects of the Athenians, for history should not be a eulogy. This people, whom we admire for its fine morality, its gentleness, and its wisdom, not seldom sullied itself with the most shameless ingratitude toward its greatest men, and with cruelty toward its vanquished enemy. Corrupted by the flattery of its speakers, haughty in its freedom, and in vanity, and in, the, at, and in vanity of so many brilliant advantages, it repressed its allies and neighbors often with unbearable pride. 
and let itself be guided in public deliberations by frivolous swindlers, swindlers who often destroyed the efforts of the wisest statesmen and tore the state to the abyss of ruin. Every individual Athenian was traceable and impressible, but in public assembly, he was no longer the same person. Thus, Aristophanes describes his countrymen to us as reasonable old men at home and as fools in the assemblies. Love of fame and thirst for novelty took hold of them to the point of excess. For fame, the Athenian would often risk all of his earthly goods, his life, and not seldom his virtue. A crown of olive branches, an inscription of a pillar proclaiming his merit, were to him more a spur to fiery deeds than all the treasures of the great king were to the Persian. As much as the Athenian people exaggerated its ingratitude, it was excessive in turn in its gratitude. To be accompanied home in triumph from the assembly by such a people, to entertain it only for one day, was a higher pleasure to the Athenian thirst for fame, and a truer pleasure, too, than his most beloved slave can give to a monarch. For it is something quite different indeed to stir an utterly proud and tender people than to please one single person. The Athenian had to be in incessant movement, ceaselessly, his mind snatched from, for new impressions, new pleasures. This addiction to novelty had to be fed each day anew, should it not turn against the state itself. Should it not turn against the state itself. Thus, a theater play often salvaged public order threatened by riot. And by the same token, a usurper often had easy game of it if he but sacrificed a series of amusement, amusements to the bent of the people. But just for that reason, woe to the most meritorious of citizens if he did not understand the art of being something new every day to rejuvenate his merits. This, the evening of Solon's life was not as cheerful as his life had deserved. To escape the obtrusiveness of the Athenians who haunted him daily with questions and proposals, as soon as his laws came into effect, he traveled through Asia Minor to the islands and to Egypt, where he discussed with the wisest men of his time and visited the royal court of Croesus in Lydia and the court at Sais in Egypt. The stories told of his meetings with Thales of Miletus and with Croesus are too well known to repeat here. Upon his return to Athens, he found the state thrown into confusion by three factions led by two dangerous men, Megacles and Pisistratus. Megacles made himself powerful and feared by his wealth, Pisistratus by his political shrewdness and genius. This Pisistratus, Pisistratus uh, Solon's former favorite and the Julius Caesar of Athens, once appeared before the popular assembly. Palin stretched out on his wagon, covered with blood from a wound he had inflicted upon his own arm. Thus, he said, have my enemies mistreated me on your account. My life is in perpetual danger if you do not take measures to protect it. Thereupon his friends proposed, as he had instructed them, that he should receive a bodyguard who should accompany him wherever he went out in public. Solon surmised the fraudulent intent of this proposal and set himself energetically but in vain against it. The proposal was accepted. Pisistratus received a bodyguard and soon thereafter he was at its head. When the guard seized the citadel of Athens, now the veil fell from the Athenians' eyes, but too late. Terror took hold of Athens. Megacles and his followers escaped from the city and left it to the usurper. Solon, who alone had been deceived, was now the only one who did not lose courage. Uh, who, who alone had not, not been deceived, right, you said? Yeah. Okay. Solon, who alone had not been deceived, was now the only one who did not lose courage. As much trouble as he had taken to hold his citizens from their rashness when there was still time, as much he now took to revive their sinking courage. When no door opened to him, he went home placed his weapons in front of his door and called out, now I have done what I could for the best of the country. When his friends asked him what made him so courageous despite those more powerful, he answered, my old age gives me the courage. 
he died, and his last glimpses saw his country not free. But Athens had not fallen into the hands of a barbarian. Pisistratus was a noble person and honored Solon's laws. Subsequently banished twice by his opponents and twice again become master of the city until he finally maintained his rule in calm by his services on behalf of the city and his brilliant virtues. It was soon forgotten that he was a usurper. Under him, no one noticed that Athens was no longer free. So mild and gentle was his government. And it was not he but Solon's laws which ruled. Pisistratus opened the golden age of Athens. Under him, the beautiful morning of Greek arts dawned. He died, mourned as a father. His work begun was carried forward by his sons, Hipparch and Hippias. Both brothers governed in harmony, and the same love of science inspired both. Simonides and Anacreon flourished under him, and the academy was founded. Everything hastened toward the magnificent age of Pericles. Okay. Yeah, I, I found that to be just one of the, the best comparative expositions I'd, I'd ever seen of something. And I mean, I'm sure people have some thoughts uh, that arose in the course of this reading, but uh, I got to say like the, having that, that sense of, of general lessons that he's conveying is one of the most useful master keys to unlocking so many uh, apparent paradoxes and, and obscurities within history. And if you have this discernment of like good laws, bad laws, and the, the clash of these two opposing ways of characterizing human beings and the purpose around which we're, we exist and how that, that's expressed in the form of laws, cultural, re religious, and economic, and, and other, um, you're able to then make sense of a lot of the dynamics in Indian, uh, Chinese, Western, all sorts of cultural matrices going back thousands of years. You start making sense of the, the, the booms and periods of renaissances and those times where you have a collapse of that potential into dark ages. And there's something similar that's, that's expressing itself in, uh, in a variety of cultures, in different ways, obviously. But he lays it out just so concretely here in this one beautiful lecture. Yeah, I mean, I think this is what you get when you're not bogged down by dogma or formalism, and you're actually just able to go into something and say what works and what doesn't, which yeah. is really what I think in most cases, I mean, that's what people lack because they have all these assumptions and, and they have all these ideas. I, I was, uh, I just was looking at the quote uh, by Lao Tzu. Uh, he says, to gain knowledge, add things every day, to gain wisdom, uh, subtract things every day. Now, I mean, it's not a, uh, yeah. Well, the idea is that in most cases, people have axioms that pre prevent them from oh, yeah. actually evaluating something for what it is. Right. If we listen to discourse on the right, left, uh, you know, uh, or any, anywhere in between, right? People have ideologies. And so they're not really able to just judge something based on its merits or not because they have these prisms. And I feel Schiller has an advantage because he's not uh, so ideologically fixed other than saying what's going to help humankind flourish to its maximum potential. And he just goes from there. That's his hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. right. And um, from my end, the, the thing is that I love the... Um... So you so you feel the state is not uh, is not developed or not formed under any uh, any strict laws, right? It, there there's almost a um, a free play or almost uh, a you mean a joyful uh, you mean um, the, 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 how, how can I say that? It's um, it's almost like a, as though. A, I, I though I mean you're instilling a love of life within the 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 body of of the uh, of of of, uh, of the the citizens that that make them um, 
that make them by themselves uh you mean know what laws to 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 proceed see you're not there's no dictate or there's no you well, how do you yeah yeah like how do you how do you legislate virtue yeah exactly you can't really I mean, you you could force people's behavior to be good, but it doesn't mean it's virtuous because it may be, you know, it's like First Corinthians thirteen, right? You could you could sing with the tongue of angels, but if you don't have love in your heart, it's just like clanging cymbals. It doesn't. It's like it's nice that you're doing it, <laughs> but it's not coming from the heart. It's not coming from love. So how do you yeah bring that about as a legislator is a very very yeah. challenging task. I feel uh, the, the the real difference between you mean the the, the first text and the the second text. Uh, it, it's like also looking at the difference between let's say the the Old Testament and the the New Testament, right? Um, where in the Old Testament you have very strict laws, you have a, a revengeful God, you have uh, someone who does not um, who, who sees a, a gap, uh, a, a massive gap between. Uh, the uh, I mean be, be, between the the be, between uh, God and man, uh, and the second one where you you've got uh, a much more um, uh, yeah you you've got uh, a much more loving interaction between between uh, I, I don't know if if you uh, if you if, uh, if it makes sense but uh... well De Declan what do you think of that one? I um, well, I, I, I kind of think that, uh, that, that the, 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 the old Testament is slight, uh, is, uh, the, the characterization of God as, uh, being a, uh, vengeful God, uh, I kind of, uh, kind of seems to me a little bit extreme, but I, that, that's, that, and that's what I believe that he, that they're, 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 they were dealing in a way with the different, uh, a different people and the, the the Jews were quite difficult. If you if you read in the thing they're all they're always they're always jacking up something. And it's I, <laughs> well I think that's actually yeah. we're touching we're touching on the topic of what Schiller will be will be treating next week in the mission of Moses. Mm -hmm. But it is interesting. I, I don't even remember if he deals with what I'm about to say directly. He definitely is going to be addressing what you say, uh, Ryan. But I know that when when Jesus was asked which of the, uh, the Ten Commandments, the Mosaic Commandments, are, is the most important one, his response was, love God and love your fellow man. And so he didn't actually pick one of the, one of the Mosaic, thou shalt not, or thou shalt, like, demands, but he, he completely flipped the game. And he's like, no, because yeah. if, if, if you do that, if you have these positive, loving, uh, uh, you know, uh, modes within your heart of God and man, then you will do those other things. You won't have to be told to do those other things. They will, that'll, that'll come natural. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, yeah. Ryan, I think that touches on what you were sort of getting at. There's this more explicit loving mandate. That's a little bit more clearly conveyed in the new Testament where sometimes, yeah, it, you, you can get a, a bit of a, yeah, <laughs> yeah. A different characteristic. <laughs> well, well, uh, like you me. look at you, you okay. look at like Exodus. It starts with the Ten Commandments, yeah. and then uh, and then Moses comes down and he finds them all. Uh, all they're all worshiping uh, golden calf, and so and so. Okay, you need to you let's get back to the basics. You have to do everything now this exact way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, that's where you get Leviticus and Deuteronomy, all yeah. the rules. Some serious slap downs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Spanking time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I, I thought it was interesting. It seemed like that the Spartans had departed from uh, the the idea of that there was natural law almost. The that it was just everything was just legislated the state, the uh, the civil law, and there was nothing there 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 was nothing that was um, higher than that, which which made them a what they were. Right. Well, like, like Schiller said, that the state should never be the means or the, the ends unto itself. The state is merely the means for a higher end to be accomplished. Mm -hmm. so it's like a tool we create, but a tool is not its own purpose. A hammer doesn't exist for its yeah. own purpose. It exists to, to fulfill a function. And that's how a, a good law and a good state is supposed to be like that too, um, which is 
the question of our true nature, right? To, to move the mind and the soul to grow and to be itself. Mm -hmm. Cause it's so easy. It's so easy. If you're like a utopian, just sitting in, in an ivory tower, calculating the best way to like have an equal uh, society of stability and peace and forget that what is the material you're actually dealing with because you're so far removed in your mental abstractions from like the material of humanity that you're you're actually dealing with <laughs> mm -hmm. uh that you can make some really bad and messy errors in, in in application like we've seen in so many cases throughout history of it you know it sounded really good seemed like a good idea at the time then you apply it and you get this disastrous bloodbath <laughs> of mm -hmm. throwing you know killing babies that were born into uh you know, anyway, it, it gets, yeah, there's ugly examples of human behavior. Yeah. It sounded like that the Spartans had kind of checkmated themselves in their own, uh, in their own thing. And now they're, now they're just stagnated. Yeah. In a single yeah. spot. Yeah. 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 I'm sure, I'm sure the, uh, the decarbonization of society and, and, uh, getting everybody, you know, in a behaviorist social credit type of system sounds all really well and good for a, a theoretician <laughs> try to solve all these problems of human war. But, uh, nah, <laughs> nah. Or genetically altering the genome to make people shorter so that they weigh less so that right. it consumes less fuel for transportation so that that yeah. becomes the emissions by a certain percentage. Right. Yeah, you sent me that video of the guy making that argument. It's a serious scientific argument he's trying to make that we could save these mathematical sums of like 25 tons of carbon per person by making each baby 20% smaller. <laughs> and over the course of a lifetime, it's like these really wonderful like ratios are going to be preserved or something. Yeah. Yeah, people are actually having these serious discussions in scientific communities around the world right now. It's, it's messed up. Or the designer baby thing is another one too, right? With cr CRISPR uh, DNA modification technologies, there's all sorts of talk about different ways we could modify babies to uh, have certain attributes that uh, will make them like fart less or something. <laughs> so that creates methane, which contributes to global warming. Yeah. Yeah, you That's hear like the transhumanists are like, okay, if we can just find this one substance that makes the brain work and kind of like connects like an electrical substance of some sort that like makes you express ideas or whatever. And then you're, and then you're like, what? And then you're sitting there and you're saying, that's the soul. You just described the soul, except the electromagnetic part. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, where have you been all this time? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like why not do good works and read books? You'll you'll find that you'll probably tap into that thing you're trying to capture chemically much more efficiently and, and naturally. Exactly. Yeah. It's actually interesting how many of these um there's all these, you know, they talk about flow states, they talk about micro dosing, they talk about this and that. Um I mean, there's this interesting movie that was pretty popular limitless there where he takes the pill and like his neurons everything you, you've seen it ryan yeah i've seen that yeah. yeah i mean it's useful to see like how these things are mm. are put into the zeitgeist but it's just like you're just going to maximize your 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 brain potential so you're going to be able to think much better more clear and that's going to make you super uh, intelligent but it's it's purely like a chemical Mm -hmm. uh, outlook and there's there's no epistemolo epistemology there's no mm -hmm. philosophical development there's no spiritual development there's no anything other mm -hmm. than we're just going to chemically or genetically alter it and that's what's going to give the results mm -hmm. and there's a million variations i mean whether it's the old school eugenics or transhumanism or just the drug culture right how many students take like adderall to study um, right. i mean that's very big yeah, yeah so it's well you have this idea embedded yeah i didn't see that movie but it all over our, our culture like a, you have it in in the matrix with neo just tapping in <laughs> you know from a, a microchip or whatever it is 
uh, to be this like ubermensch Superman that becomes almost like a Christ figure at the end. Um, or in the case, there was a newer movie I'd seen a, a few months ago called Lucy. Um, yeah. With Scarlett Johansson, I think. And uh, yeah, it's something similar where she's like, she taps into the, they have a, a chemical or I forget the, the details, but yeah, she basically taps into like the full potential of the brain. And she's basically like this supercomputer, you know, in terms of like just having encyclopedic knowledge, you know, at, at split second speed. And then she ends up like just converting herself into pure energy in the uh, in the in the universe or something. But yeah, again, there is no learning. <laughs> there is no actual thinking epistemologically anywhere on those journeys. Um, it was just like. Yeah, inject something, plug you plug something into you and all of a sudden you just tap into these magical sources. It's dumb. Philosophically speaking, it's very dumb. Like it's it's just total lack of idea of there's no irony, right? There's no like how do you solve a paradox? It's all assumed these things just happen magically if you have like higher intelligence, you know, if you're genetically uh enhanced, you're just gonna be better at that. Mm-hmm. I like well, to also, hmm? yeah. go on. I like to also compare seeing that we were talking about films if you we also compare like today's films with especially the, the films that, that came out in the sixties maybe or fifties. Uh the uh just the the uh, the um you mean it it's as you said, like yeah, on on the in the older older movie, there is always this. Uh, um, there's nothing uh, you're not talking about. You mean you 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 have a certain innocence. You have this this uh, uh, an an insight into into uh, just the joy of life. Uh, there there's a lot of uh, it's very. You mean it's uh, the uh, the screenplay is very soft, very mellow. There's something uh, very beautiful, you mean, in, in the in, in the movies. But when when you compare it to, uh, to to today's movies, you're always trying to hit that pleasure extreme, right? How do you go beyond? How do you uh, how do you incite more uh, more pleasure, right? How do you uh, get more pre- creative with with the the absurdity the absurdities that you could uh, that you could envision envision so that the the, the the viewer craves even more you see so it's uh-huh. yeah well that's what schiller talked about right with the athenians the novelty i mean right. our you right. know what's what that's what entertainment is today right it's not so much art as it is uh entertainment and you always got to come up with something new and naturally um well as well it's it's also my friend adam was talking about this like it's very what you see is what you get, right? There's not like many layers of meaning and whatnot. It's largely just like enter, like it's drama, but it's, oh, what's gonna happen next? You know, it's like soap opera, you know, dramatic, like, oh, this person cheated on that. Oh, it turns out like they killed that person. And oh, this person backstabbed that person. But there's nothing more <laughs> really than like that surface level. Um, and so it's it's like you always have to find new, more extreme ways of of sort of jolting people, and uh, it just it becomes decadent, right? Mm-hmm. I, I was looking at all the uh, just notice how many movies and series today. It's 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 always just criminals. It's criminals who like the system is corrupt, so they just they're in the business of either stealing, killing. Uh, scamming, robbing, like there's so many series on this and it's always the same theme. And it's, it's, you know, the assumption is that the system is screwed up. So like, and you're never empathizing with like the cops or like the, 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 the legal system, right. Which is, is problem is, is also corrupted, but it's always like the criminals are kind of the romantic uh, figures that you, they're more likable at least. And they're, they're more real. Um, and that just made me appreciate, you know, so we see the extreme today where there's all this stuff. And then like in China, you know, they had this story about how they, they censored fight club. Like they changed the ending of the movie fight club so that instead of like buildings getting blown up by terrorists and like everybody getting away, uh, and sort of winning the day, 
uh, they the terrorists got caught and that you know the, the mastermind was put in a mental institution because he's crazy he wanted to blow up buildings and stuff uh and people were outraged They're like oh china's censoring and da, da, da. and then the the author of the book actually came out he's like well china's ending is actually closer to the book number one so the hollywood version encourages anarchists blowing up buildings and like style, style stuff even if it's not part of the story right um, right that's way. funny <laughs> then that made me appreciate going back to plato's time mm. why you know in the republic should we ban the poets from our republic you know because there are implications for the kind of art and it's he's posing a paradox right he's not making an ironclad uh, edict here he's saying these this art and entertainment this culture has a fundamental effect on the fabric of our society so what is it that we actually want to put out there um there are implications and so like the poets and the artists were played that role today that we have like hollywood and all this stuff playing you know they didn't have tv so the question is well how do we what do we do about this it's a big question you know and we see the extreme now when everything is just promoting criminals sex drugs and like Mm -hmm. uh, really extreme doesn't mean censor it but you see that if you're not having a discussion about these things it gets really uh wild yeah well it definitely has a huge huge effect on on organizing our um, our identities the this invisible cultural field that we're it's like we're seeds in 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 soil and the question is how do you know if that soil is fertile or not or barren and it's difficult for people because they don't see it as soil. You could see and pick up soil or you, and you could judge it accordingly. Um, but our, the, the culture is not something you could see in a, in a direct way. It's like this invisible field we're born into. It came before us and it's bringing out certain passions, certain assumptions about our relationship, who we are, what is government are all being embedded into the subconscious uh, where people think, oh, but that's not like, you know, I could just let everything in because it's just for entertainment. No one's trying to persuade me of anything. So I could just enjoy myself and like let down all my critical thinking. Right. And then meanwhile, all of that stuff bubbling under the surface, under your, where you're not even aware, that's all being influenced in a, in a deep way. So that that way, who you, you become and how you react to certain events in life as they come will be influenced big time. Right. So you'll be more inclined to adapt to things that might be otherwise morally you know apprehensible like you you you'd never you would normally see tyranny and you you'd instinctively a, a, a mature human would be like okay well let's do something about this we, we have mass injustice we've got you know unnecessary death and and suffering let's do something about this but instead you're like well that's just the way it is you know or let's just you know try to try to go along and, and get along and you know and you you don't realize that these reactions are super unnatural. These are the, these are the effects of just having immersed yourself in years of, of bad culture. Um, and the fact that the CIA openly pours so much money over many decades into scripts, right? Like what scripts are going to be accepted and then turned into multi-million dollar movies and which scripts are rejected. I mean, it's openly acknowledged. It's, you know, that the CIA is all over that shit. <laughs> yeah. And there's a reason for it. So yeah, this atomization, this, this alienation of the individual, it's, it's somewhat valuable. If you don't want to have people arise like a Martin Luther King Jr. or a John F. Kennedy, you don't want to have those characteristics arise within your target society. There are certain types of cultural stories you would want them to be saturated with to, to numb that, that potential as much as possible. But that goes back to your question, Ryan, or your, your observation that when you do go to a lot of the movies from the 1940s and 50s, there is a, a greater... And I just shared a link to the Rising Tide Foundation cinema picks, but because you do still get modern movies that do that do good things, they're they're rare, but they're there. But there's a lot more of a of a quality of of really you know in the director, the story, the stories are are more frequently engaged with making better citizens, giving you some some lesson on some amplify you know on some level. You're coming out of that experience a better person or with a bit more insight into something of value. And that's, that's much more rare today. 
Yeah, I kind of think that uh, uh, the the actors back then as well were so much better. If you like watched like uh, some, some of these mm. old movies of, like Cary Grant and the dialogue he does, the the back and forth dialogue that goes on, and some of these and some of these movies is quite amazing sometimes. Mm. It's quite fun. Mm. There's an Alfred Hitchcock movie called The Rope, uh, which yeah. I we just rewatched again. It's brilliant. It's all it's all filmed in one single like two hour take. It's so well planned out, and it's it's a piece of art. And Jimmy Stewart is is one of the the, the protag- uh, protagonists, but it's it's based on partially a true story of these two yeah. like Yale ivory t- um, upper crust kids, you know, um, who are really just bored. They're from rich families. They're just bored with life. And there's the third friend, and they want to test out some of the theories that one of their teachers, who's Jimmy Stewart, was teaching them. In, in, in the classroom about what's obviously like the theories of, uh, of Friedrich Nietzsche and the Uber mention from the, uh, the Antichrist, um, his last work. And, uh, and they're like, let's just, let's, you know, the will to power, let's just put this in action. Let's test this out. We can't just live in theory all the time. Let's do it. And they, they go and kill their, they create a situation where they actually kill their third friend just to like, <sighs> you know, get across that the, the ethical norms of society don't apply to the elite, only to the, those who are like, you know, lower in, in part of the mob. And, uh, and then they have, they have a dinner party. And the whole thing um, takes place in this dinner party where their teacher is invited with a few other people, including the girlfriend of the, the killed friend who's, whose body is like stuffed in a chest. And the whole thing is just playing out and playing out. And the teacher, he, you could see that he didn't make the connection between his theories and their application. <laughs> and he's been, you know, this whole, his whole life, he's been just immersed in, in, this, in, in his head space. And he never thought any of his students were actually going to do <laughs> what he's been doing. Them. And he's just so shocked and horrified when he realizes what's happening. It's, it's quite good. Yeah. We just recently uh, watched uh, 12 Angry Men the, uh, with uh, oh, yeah. Henry Fonda. And that was amazing. Fantastic. Yeah, that's so good. I know. Have you seen that one, Ryan? Yeah, I have. Um, oh, yeah, it's so good. Yeah. yeah, that transforms you. Like, that just makes you mm-hmm. more... Because, yeah, you, I could see so many people in the audience. Like, I'm sure, like, 95% of the audience going in watching that would not have known how to resolve that very difficult question right. of, like, this kid, you would think, deserves the death penalty, like, for the crime that he committed. And just that one person is just not convinced <laughs> and they, yeah. stick, they stick to their guns. And they're like, no, I'm not, I got to sleep at night. I'm not going to go along with this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It is amazing. It's cool. I was filmed in this one room, the entire thing, just yeah. in one room. Yeah. Also the, uh, have you guys uh, watched the, the passion of Joan of Arc? From the 1920s, 1929 or something? Yeah. 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 Oh, that's good. Yeah. Visually, that's stunning. Way ahead of its time. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's good. I've still never seen the a good rendition of of Schiller's Schiller's treatment of Joan of Arc. I've I've never seen. It's probably out there, but I've never seen a good treatment of that. But there's definitely a lot of material. I mean, for future moral filmmakers and artists to work with, <laughs> there's so much material from history and and drama to, to to bring to cinema it's it's great you need a better yeah. society <laughs> yeah but it's funny though you know when you, when you actually look at uh uh like the culture of like what uh i find it interesting just to, like watch sometimes chinese movies just to see what what sort of movies are they putting out there to to shape the their their culture right um and there's this whole classical Confucian revival, like a renaissance happening where they're like portraying, there's one really good movie called uh, Confucius, simply that, Confucius from 2010, on the, uh, the actual life of who was Confucius, what was the political role he was playing, how was he intervening on courts, what were the moral principles he was trying to bring in. And it was, it's like a lot of like dense, thick drama. Um, but there's a lot more of a tendency to try to infuse, sometimes forced. The, the Chinese still sometimes overly force the, the ethical lessons without that sort of subtlety of just taking a step back and letting the audience figure it out for themselves, which has a lot of value. <laughs> um, so they're, they're still trying to figure some stuff out, but, but there's a much, it's much more present, a, a desire to try to get across uh, an ethical lesson in a lot of the shows or, or movies that I'm seeing. 
um, which is, yeah, it's good. Of course, you, you got shit as well. And <laughs> that's there too. Yeah. Oh, Dave, Dave left? Oh, Dave. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> got to go to the gym before it closes. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's understandable. <laughs> cool. Well, guys, it's 10 15. Um, yep. It's a fun conversation about cinema. I didn't expect that to happen, but it makes sense because because Schiller is a, is, if he was alive today, he wouldn't, yeah, he would be directing films. So, yeah, it makes perfectly good sense that we, that I went in this direction. <laughs> so, yeah, next week we'll do a Mission of Moses. And uh, I'll send you guys, Cynthia did a really good class on Plato versus the cult of Delphi. Uh, going through the origins of the Areopagus and this whole thing, like the, the geopolitical environment of Solon all the way through uh, Alexander the Great um, and the role of specifically Plato's Academy within that broader context, how it was created. Uh, uh, it's really good. So I'll just send that to you guys. Um, you know, I think you'll, if you're able to watch it before next week, that'd be, that it, I think would set the stage for some of what we're going to discuss because it brings in Egypt as well. And can't talk about Moses if you don't look at Egypt. All right. Yeah, yeah. Bye, guys. All right. Bye. See ya. Yeah.